So let's just talk about sampling in general. Because we're not looking at 100% of the items, we have risk, right? We already know that. We have audit risk, we have control risk, and inherent risk, and detection risk. So we know from the audit risk model that the audit is a risk-based audit, right? That there's risk that we're accepting as auditors because we cannot look at 100% of the items, because we don't control the transactions that flow through, and inherently we don't know management's motivations, right? We can only assess it. So we know that there's some risk that, um, you know, we might make this, reach this incorrect conclusion based on our testing, right? Because we're sampling, we're going to select, let's say, 100 items out of maybe 1,000 items, and that's conservative, right? So that the, the 9,000 items, there might be an error in those 9,000 items that we didn't detect. Right? Because we never selected those things. So there is the risk that the auditor reaches an incorrect conclusion because the sample is not representative of the population. Right? So when we talked in about assertions and we talked about completeness and the importance of having pre-numbered documents, well, this is one of the reasons, right? You want to be able to, you want to have, be able to reconcile that if there were 1,000 sales transactions in the year, that you can account for all of the sales uh, orders from 1,000 to, uh, from 1 to 1,000, that your population includes all of the sales transactions that occur. So you're going to look at the numerical sequence. Um, and that's just, the sampling risk is just by the nature of the audit, it's an inherent risk, right, for the audit. I mean, it's just an inherent part of the audit. So what we do to try to minimize that risk, right, as auditors, is we control um, by determining what the appropriate sample size is. And then ensure that all items have an equal opportunity of being selected, and then mathematically evaluate the sample result. So most, most if not all firms, have statistical sampling packages and their approach to statistical sampling. What I found interesting, uh, as I was just kind of reviewing the chapter for this, this, this lecture, was that there was a, a, a little sidebar in there, that about 74% of people responded to this survey that they actually use haphazard sampling. Right? That is not statistical sampling, um, that is more haphazard, which is, is kind of uh, surprising, especially in this day and age. With the, with the ability of technology. So the, uh, a lot of, for some weird reason, a lot of people are not using, or auditors are not using statistical sampling. But nonetheless, firms have their own statistical packages, and I'm sure on larger clients that they are using more statistical sampling techniques. Now I remember <coughs> when I was an auditor, uh, we didn't have statistical sampling. At least we didn't use it on the audits that I was on. And, out, and when I was doing test of controls or something like that, testing transactions, I had to come up. We, we had a way of coming up with a random sample because we needed it to be random. And uh, so we kind of took this approach of, you know, we want to look at there are 1,000 items, uh, transactions, and we want to look at 100. So, you know, we figure out what, what that meant in terms of every nth item, and then I randomly closed my eyes, had a dollar bill, put my finger on it, and whatever that number was, that became my every, that, the, every other number I looked at, right? So that's where I started with. That was my random starter. And I looked, if, it's, if my finger landed on a nine, then I looked at every ninth item until I reached, uh, you know, the required number of uh, items that I needed to look, look at. So it wasn't statistical, but it was random. It was a random sa sample. Now, obviously, all of that stuff is done statistically, or can be done statistically. So non-sampling risk is the risk that the auditor tests, that your audit tests do not uncover, right, um, a, a material misstatement or an error or a deviation if it's in a control or exceptions in this example. So that would be because the auditor has failed to do something, right? So the auditor. Uh, failed to recognize that what was an exception, right? 
So for example, if the auditor was testing disbursements, let's say on this disbursement uh, scenario, and they selected 100 disbursements, and one of the, dis like, there was an exception where uh, the voucher package did not include a purchase requisition or didn't include a vendor's invoice. That's an exception. But the auditor didn't list that as an exception, right? Because they felt as though, well, we see the receiving report, so we know that the goods were received and there's a liability because we received it. By not having the purchase order in there, that's a deviation from that control environment, right? If the control environment calls for a purchase order, a receiving report, and a vendor invoice, the fact that there's no purchase order in that voucher package means that that's an exception. Now, whether you can figure out if it was actually received, there's con there are controls in place. You are relying on controls that says that on disbursements are only made when we have these, this three-way match, right? Because what happens there, right, is if you don't see that control is an exception, yeah, you know they received the goods, but you don't know if the purchase was authorized, right? Because that's what the purchase order tells you, right? You don't know if they've been, they paid that invoice twice because the vendor invoice is not there, right? So you can't trace it. So those are things, so the auditor failure to recognize exceptions or inappropriate or ineffective audit procedures, right? If the auditor doesn't design, so that's the importance of thinking about assertions, right? What are we trying to, if the management makes assertions about occurrence, the best way to test that assertion about occurrence, if we're talking about sales and collections, right, is to start with a sample of sales and tie those back to shipping documents, right? That tells us that the sale is a valid sale. If the auditor, you, if the auditor selects shipping documents and ties those back to the sales journal, that's an ineffective audit procedure to test occurrence. That only tells you that all of the items that are valid items have been included in the sales journal. It doesn't tell you that sales, the sales journal only includes valid sales, right? So that's an ineffective audit procedure to test occurrence. Right? So that's what we call non-sampling risk. How do we address that? By training and supervision. Think about the third standard of field work. Uh, I mean, uh, the first standard, right? In terms of auditors have to be trained they have to be knowledgeable about the areas that they're auditing. They have to be properly supervised. That's gap, gas. Reasonable working conditions and effort, right? So it's only so much, uh, a big part of it is, is the auditor, right? The auditor has to be knowledgeable. They have to recognize when they don't know something, so they ask questions. And it has to be an environment that allows for that. Right? It has to be proper review and feedback so that auditors are learning. And auditors have to put forth the effort.